I think that what you're seeing right now uh, in terms of change on the coast of South Carolina with old timers and old time families that you talk to is pronounced. Um, and so if you look at the actual math, sea levels along the coast of South Carolina have risen about four inches since I graduated from high school. Four inches doesn't sound like that much, but there's a reason you call it the low country of South Carolina. It's really low and an inch can make a big difference. And so literally, areas that were growing pine trees on our family farm when I was a boy, now are, are, are you know, you have the dead trees standing there, but are no longer growing trees. They're in essence on their way to becoming salt flats. I mean, it, it is so rapid that you're seeing it, not in the, 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 the notion of geological time, which is you know thousands and thousands of years, I'm literally seeing it in my lifetime. You talk to old timers that, that, that uh, in, for instance, downtown Charleston, and they talk about the number of times that it used to flood versus how often it floods now with the king tide. Uh, we just got hit by this latest storm, and uh, we, we saw uh, a level of flooding that we've never before seen at our family farm, ever. Uh, it literally, the, the storm surge, picked up, a, we have one bridge that goes into a timber track, picked the bridge up off the pilings, moved it about 50 yards off in the marsh, and set it back down. And you're like, oh my goodness, that's another weekend project plus uh, in terms of getting my brothers and uh, you know dragging the thing back there with a piece of heavy equipment and putting it back on. Those are minor inconveniences. We've lost our whole dock in this latest storm. Um, those are minor inconveniences though relative to what we'll see in, in, in larger metropolitan areas. You think about the water that was coming over the battery in this last storm and how, again, we're seeing a pattern to things that have never happened before happening with great regularity. It's interesting, uh, the question of whether or not this issue is really on people's radar screen. Uh, I would say increasingly it is. If you were to talk to Carlos Cobella, who represents uh, a piece of Miami, what he tells me is that people are talking about it in ways that they never have before, particularly given the fact that his district goes down to the Keys and old timers there are seeing, we are seeing things we've never seen before. I used to have this debate with a guy named Tom Coburn who represented a piece of Oklahoma. Uh, and I, you know, I'd say, well, you know, what, what's global warming mean to you? I mean, frankly, you're at a couple hundred feet of elevation. Your climate really isn't the greatest nothing against Oklahoma. Uh, what do you care? Uh, but if you go to places where people actually retire, which happens to be the coastal regions of this country, uh, we're reaching to something of a tipping point given the number of people that are coming to places like Florida or the coast of Texas or the coast of South Carolina or Georgia. And these are areas, you know, it used to be, I mean, there was about 100 years where in essentially very, very few people lived in the low country of South Carolina because they knew every so often a hurricane comes in or a hurricane comes out. There was a phosphate mining operation that was set up on, uh, you know, where our family farm is now. It got wiped out in the hurricane of, I think it was 1914, but there were back-to-back -back hurricanes, 1913 and 1914, wiped out. There were about 2,000 people killed in a hurricane late in the 1800s. We didn't have the ability to forecast as we do now. But what you've got right now is increasing numbers of retirees living in a place like Sun City or living in tidal creeks along the, the different rivers and creeks that make up the, the low country stretching from, you know, sort of Jacksonville up to maybe Wilmington, North Carolina. That's not the low country, but I'm saying that area. And, and you know, with, with that population comes voice. So I think that in political terms, it's reaching a level of voice that has never been there in part because of population change and the distribution of our population. It's also reaching a tipping point because people can see it, they can feel it, they can touch it in ways that weren't the case. I mean, literally, you're seeing the effects of, of flooding. The, our farm flooded in a way that I've never seen over the course of my 57 years on Earth with this last storm. And you're also seeing a level of consensus within the scientific community that's never been there before. They are saying, wait a minute, look at what's happening in the polar caps. There is a degree of ice melt we've never seen before. And there's not just a few scattered scientists saying this, there is consensus in the scientific community on this front. So 
from three different points, I would say there is an emerging consensus that this is a real problem, and it's something we're going to have to deal with. Because change is hard. Um, you know, we have a political system that is designed to react, not to anticipate. And, you know, at times we all wish for, I, I'd like to see more leadership on this issue, that issue, but fundamentally, what the Founding Fathers set up was a system that reacts to the will of the people. And that's why I said that emerging consensus with people that are increasingly living along the coast is going to matter in the debate that's going to come before us because one, those people didn't live there 100 years ago. We had concentrations in places like New York or Chicago or LA, uh, but, but not, not so much in you know, towns and hamlets scattered along our coastal uh, areas. And so I, I'd say it's difficult because change is hard and there hasn't been the level of vote count, of voice, necessary to propel some of those ideas. I'd also say this, um, uh, I guess it was Churchill who once observed the beauty of the American political system is that it does, it always does the right thing, comma, after it's exhausted every other possible remedy. And so there is a degree, uh, whether in our personal lives, whether in the body politic, as a reflection of personal opinion, we're in, we, we hope for the best and we, we, you know, until something sort of hits us in the face, we at times don't deal with it. Um, we have a way of procrastinating, particularly in, in, in big, with big issues because they are hard. So, you know, for instance, there was a, 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 a executive order that was signed by President Obama that said, you know what, given the fact that there seems to be consensus on the issue of global warming, and, and sea level rise. It's not even going into the debate of who caused it, who didn't cause it, just it's occurring. Therefore, with public infrastructure, we're gonna require you to build to different standards to take into account possible flooding or whatnot. Yeah, most people would say that's kind of common sense. The, the new administration's come in and they've undone that executive order. And you're like, wait a minute, uh, three monkeys, I hear no evil, I see no evil, I speak no evil may work for monkeys, but it doesn't work for humans as it relates to rising water levels that are real and documented. Uh, again, pull the chart. They're fascinating charts that show the number of times downtown flooded over the last hundred years versus over the last, let's say, 20 years or so. It's remarkable. It's real. And, and so what's happening, though, is people want to avoid hard decisions in the world of politics. And if it's you know debatable, let's debate it some more. And so this this executive order gets undone. Well, I just went on a letter saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. I don't like it. I'm not attributing blame. We're not. We can have that debate another day. But we got to deal with what we got to deal with. And the fact is, in places like the coast of South Carolina, we're seeing in real, visible, and tangible form rising effect of sea level. And therefore, if you're going to build a road. Don't build it where it's going to get flooded every couple of years. Maybe put a little more dirt underneath, and wouldn't that save money over time? So I think it's, you know, we have a way of, of procrastinating in the world of politics, and it's a reflection, I suspect, of our will as human beings and the way that we'll all procrastinate on different tough choices that come our way. Yeah, I mean, the question of cost is, is going to be a real one in, in this debate. And I think that um, you sort of think about it, you know, prevention is an issue that will be driven um, at a sort of a global level. Uh, reaction is going to be driven very locally. And so the, 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 the reaction cost, the, the cost of what's occurring, I think is disproportionately going to be born at a local level, which means either you're in luck or you're out of luck. In a place like um, Charleston, there's enough money here for people to say, we got to do what we got to do. And let's go ahead and create a levy system like they got in New Orleans, and we're going to protect what we got. But in a place like Dale, South Carolina, uh, there ain't much money there. And places like that, in time, will become the lost cities of Atlantis that'll literally be flooded. I mean, our family farm will be gone.
I mean, there, there are just a lot of places where in, you don't have big concentrations of public inv and private investment, and people say, well, there's no saving this. I guess we keep walking. And, and so, so I, 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 I think it's going to create real winners and losers in the equation. Um, uh, and I think that, again, I, it, it's, it's part of where I, why I bought my house. Where I, bought, I, I have a little house over on the Mount of Mount Pleasant. It's at about 30 feet of elevation. And it's kind of crazy, but it, part of the reason I decided to pick this little spot was it had elevation. I mean, I think that increasingly people are going to think about either the costs that might come their way as a result of flooding, uh, or they're going to think about how do I deal with the taxes that might be tied with protecting what I've got. So I, I think it's going to be the source of much debate, because when you talk about taking money out of people's pocketbooks and wallets, it fosters debate. Yeah, the question of how, you know, how do you get everybody talking to each other and on the same wavelength at the federal, state, and local level um, is going to be difficult because two things. One, uh, change uh, results as a consequence of a burning platform. Uh, it was interesting. I was reading an article this morning about a ship that sunk. It was an 800-foot ship that sank uh, in one of these recent storms off the, the Bahamas. And the captain said, nah, you know, he was in denial. And basically the findings were that the captain caused the death of these 30 sailors uh, unnecessarily because he thought that the ship could handle the, the wave action that it ultimately could not. And, and so I think that what you're going to do is you're going to get some level of continued denying of, 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 of this phenomenon. I've said it to, to you know Jeff Duncan, who's in our delegation. He's up in the mountains. He's, <laughs> his district is at minimum at, at several hundred, hundreds of feet and a maximum of several thousand feet. I said, it doesn't matter that much to you. It's sort of abstract. But it's not abstract on the coast of South Carolina. It's a very different perspective. So you'll have people that continue to deny it because it's not upfront and immediate and real the way it is for folks that are living on the coast. So. I think it'll take a while to get us on the same wavelength because people have different perspectives. And what people react to is a burning platform. And not till the platform is burning in their backyard is it real. It's said that, you know, uh, a recession is when my, you know, neighbor across the street doesn't have their job. A depression is when I don't have a job. Same phenomenon, but much more real to the person who has personal loss. Um, and I, I, you know, we have a system, again, that is incremental in nature. It, it takes small steps. And I, I guess what I'm, uh, let me phrase all this a different way. Big issues require leadership. And uh, we got a lot of chiefs in the American uh, society. That's the way our society works. Everybody's a chief. There are no Indians. And, and yet, for big issues to get solved, it requires a degree of unification, a degree of consensus that comes with, again, national leaders driving a stake in the ground and saying, this I believe to be true north. And then people will react to it. They'll react for it and against it, but it causes certain lines to form, and then you can have a debate about where that line ought to go. We don't yet have national leadership on this issue. It's, it's why I went on the Gibson uh, resolution. There are, I guess, only 20 Republicans that have done so. But I think that we need to step out and say, uh, in whatever form we hold, this is a problem. And ultimately, it will take for us to get real consensus in terms of federal, state, and local. It's going to require leadership at the presidential level. Should it be that difficult to find state consensus? No. Is it? Yes. Uh, because people haven't connected the dots yet. I think that when people do the second level of thought, which you just did, and they say, wait a minute, for me to sell the car in BMW where my constituent works on a daily basis, it has to go through the port in Charleston. And the port in Charleston is now saying it's becoming a problem as we got to look at changing infrastructure. Now it's becoming real, but it requires that second level of thought which oftentimes people don't sort of think through the way in which indeed we are connected. Uh, the degree to which, you know, certain months of the year 
Myrtle Beach is driving about a third of all tourism tax-related revenue for the state of South Carolina. Um, if you look at, uh, again, what's happening at MUSC and its implication for a kid in the neonatal unit who may be from Pickens County, I mean, it all gets connected real fast, but you've got to sort of think it through. And in this debate, I don't know that we're yet to the point of connecting that second dot. So that's the fine line of politics, and nobody gets it quite perfect. But what I do know, again, going back to the Founding Fathers, is that they were incredibly deliberate in setting up a republic and not a democracy. They did not want simple, I mean, because if so, we could just say, all have voting uh, machines on our phone, and we just vote instantaneously, it'd be recorded in Washington, and we'd go with whatever it is. They set up a very different system. They set a, re a, re a republic when we'd be represented, and, and the, the point was not perfectly, you can't, I mean, I represent about 750,000 people. You can't, on any given day, get a perfect consensus as to exactly what public opinion is on any given topic. And so what they wanted folks to do, given their belief in reason as a sort of a foundation for our republic, was for people to be learned, study these issues, and make the best call that they thought that they could make in representing their district. Part of that would be public input from today, but part of it would be stuff that you might have heard in a hearing. Part of it would be stuff that you might have read and studied. Part of it would, might be talking to a scientist that would have been on an ice sheet in Greenland or in Antarctica. You combine all those things and say, this is where I am. And then you owe it to people to communicate it. And that's oftentimes difficult as well, because the conduit by which we do that is the media. And at times, if it bleeds, it leads. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And therefore, at times, sometimes it's difficult to get that word back of, of this is why I think this viewpoint best represents where you're coming from. So part of the role of representative is as an educator to say, nobody's talking about the debt and the deficit right now, but it's a big, big problem. Erskine Bowles, who was on the Bowles-Simpson Commission, former chief of staff to President Clinton, said this is the most predictable crisis, f predictable financial crisis in the history of man. And, and yet we're not really looking at it. Well, it's important for us to look around the curve and say, if we don't do something about it, it's going to be a bigger problem. Let's talk about it. I was doing that this morning at a breakfast. The same holds true with, the, again, the magnitude of what we might be looking at with climate change. Because it's not just about a couple of inches and then a couple of feet and then a couple of more feet uh, and maybe as much as 30 feet, which means my, my district is nest it's completely wiped off the map. Um, but it's about what is the strength and intensity of hurricanes coming forward. You know, we had something that's never happened before in the history of our republic, which is two back-to-back -back category four storms nearly simultaneously hit in the United States. It's never happened before. What's it mean in terms of drought patterns in the Midwest or the upper Midwest going forward and our ability to grow grain, which feeds our nation? What's it mean on the intensity of rainstorms so it doesn't rain in some places, but when it rains in others, it rains really, really hard to the point of flooding with places like Shadow Moss, where I just visited a couple of weeks ago in the wake of this last storm. And, and their problem, again, was not storm surge. Their problem was simply rainfall and the amount of it. So I, I just think that there are a lot of policy questions that fall into this debate that are going to take time, and we're going to need to find some level of consensus on because if not, we're going to be like that ship that went down off the Bahamas. Ah, it's not a big problem. Turned out to be a much bigger problem. I don't know. The question is, you know, can big problems be solved in the present political environment? And the answer, unfortunately, is I don't know. Um, I hope so. We need it to be so. We desperately need it to be so. But um, I'm seeing some patterns develop in the same way that we can see the certainty of, of water level rise and intensity of storms and those kinds of things as being a troubling pattern as it relates to climate change. The political climate is seeing similarly eerie patterns in terms of intensity of storms and the way in which rhetoric seems to be scaling up um, without, uh, again, uh, meaningful change in people's lives that comes as a consequence of that heated rhetoric. 
And so what I'd say is, um, and I've said this many times, uh, we have something that is broken and faulty in public discourse right now. There's a level of crassness and severity uh, and um, blame uh, that, that is a problem for all of us, and we're all going to have to fix it. And I've said, going from the president on down to the local, lo lo most local resident, we're all going to have to be part of the solution here. Um, that it's not one fix, but a lot of people got to do something a bit differently. I've said the president needs to get off Twitter. That to have an opinion that's caustic in nature about all too many subjects under the sun causes an equal and opposite reaction. That at times he creates some of his own storms. And to the person that's anonymous on their computer and they're firing off some fiery response on Facebook because they think that they're anonymous, no, it ends up being part of the public discourse. All of us can have a hand in dialing this thing a notch back because if not, we're not going to be able to solve some of the bigger problems if we're simply blaming the other person, looking for a villain, and not looking at, at times within ourselves. All change begins within oneself uh, for solution. To say, what is it I've got wrong? What is it that I you know, don't understand? Can I have a little bit of humility uh, in the way I approach things? The Bible is so consistent in this notion of, of, of walking humbly, of of, of, of uh, you know, actually uh, uh, speaking a bit more slowly and listening a bit more and having a degree of humility in saying, I don't know it all. If we all just did a touch of that, I think we could go a long way to solving some of these more contentious issues. Without some of that change, again, at all levels of our society, I think we're going to have some profound problems coming our way. Uh, so the question is on winners and losers, not just in terms of individuals, but some of, uh, of, of the special spots that make, um, in essence, create the fabric and texture for the society we live in. I think that they could be hardest hit. I mean, I was down at Penn Center the other day, and it's, it's a, a monument to um, an incredible period of time in our country's history. It's a monument to the end of one era and the beginning of another. Uh, and yet places like that would be very much threatened. Fort Fremont is down the corner down at the end of St. Helena's Island, a reminder of big conflicts and how we got prepared for them. If you look across the way at Hilton Head, there's an incredibly, uh, Mitchellville, incredibly historically significant you know, area there. I mean, I could go down the list and you go back to uh, you know, Port Royal and you're going there at Paris Island to not just current day history with what the Marine Corps is doing, but to the Spaniards there, you know, hundreds of years ago. I mean, so yeah, there is an incredible threat to some of the fabric of who we are as a people. And the saying is, if you don't learn from the past, you're destined to repeat it. Part of learning about your past is actually being able to walk and see it. Oh yeah, this is how this happened, and this is why this happened. So I think that, yeah, there's a real threat there. So what you're talking about is, look, when people talk about climate change, they really need to be thinking about something much more broad than sea level rise or intensity of hurricanes or more rainfall or less rainfall, but actually to the ecosystems and what they support, the actual environment. And so, you know, we had a scare here just recently with Zika virus. Who's ever been talking about Zika virus or, you know, yellow fever, things like that? In the United States, well, in part because we had a winter that came through and sort of cleared these things out for the next season, um, with the exception of maybe Florida and Puerto Rico and parts of Texas. Uh, you know, if you have a warming climate, and all of a sudden we move to more and more of a tropical climate in Georgia and South Carolina, places like that, it leaves the specter of all kinds of mosquito-borne illnesses and threats and challenges that weren't there. So I, I, again, there are a whole host of things that go well beyond sea level rise that come with the possibility of global warming that we all need to be thinking about. Um, I guess the question there is sort of lessons learned thus far uh, as a result of uh, it being a robust storm year. 
And I'd say, we don't know yet. Other than that, I was having a conversation with Garrett Graves the other day. And Garrett Graves is from Louisiana, where they've dealt with flooding for a long number of years. And he was, and he's on a, a committee, subcommittee of jurisdiction within transportation that would impact, you know, how we relate to storms and, and preparing for them. His point was, we've got the model completely wrong. We need to think about the model. Right now, we will pay a bunch of money for disaster relief, but really, we don't put that much money into disaster preparedness. And that goes back to the public infrastructure, you know, executive order uh, that I was talking about a minute ago in terms of how are we going to build roads and public facilities going forward. But it also relates to even the things like flood insurance. Can we incentivize more people? Because more, fewer and fewer people are signing up for flood insurance at the very time when there are more and more floods. And, and yet, how do we incentivize more and more people to do that? Because if not, we're going to pay multiples of that dollar in terms of public policy down the road with disaster consequence related stuff, but we're not going to put more of the money into, in essence, encouraging and incentivizing more people to take steps on their own to prevent disaster in their own backyard and in their own home. And so I think that there are beginnings of conversations about how do you reorder public policy? Given the intensity and the frequency of storms lately, how do we do more not just to react to them, but to be prepared for them? What I think is fascinating about this whole debate is that at one level, people will applaud the president for taking down an executive order that would have caused us as a society to think a little bit more deliberately about being prepared for flood damage and other things in public infrastructure. But at the same time, the most one of the most revered public organizations out there is the U.S. military. And what's the U.S. military doing? They're doing exactly what the old executive order said to do, which is to building into their MILCON budgets and their planning process the possibility of sea level rise. So the, if they've got a low-lying facility, they're saying, what do we do about it? What do we do to be prepared going forward with this I I eventuality? And, and, and so there's, a, there's cognitive dissonance out there. People are on the one hand saying, well, I don't need to deal with it, but, but at the same time, I revere the military and they're dealing with it, they're getting prepared for it, they're building it in their planning process. I think it's something we need to consider. The military, you know, isn't perfect, as is the case with any human organization, but they are very deliberate. They have a planning process that is a part of what they do. And the fact that they're building in uh, sea level rise and global warming into their planning process probably is an omen, or at least a suggestion for the rest of us, that maybe we ought to, too.